Do you miss being a professional Premier League footballer? No, I don't miss me having to lace my boots up and go out at three o'clock. I miss my friends. I miss the changing room. I don't actually miss the football itself. You've played with Ronaldo, but who would you say is the best player that you've ever played with? Paul Scholes is definitely the most talented footballer that I've been around. Similar to like Iniesta and Xavi, that type of player. Yeah. Where do you see the luxury watch market going in the next 12, 24 months? Can it go any lower than where it is now? I, think, I, like to say, I, like, I like to think the bottom is out. Kim Richardson is a friend of mine, a former Premiership footballer, playing for the likes of England and also Manchester United. Our podcast spoke a little bit about football, but it was mostly about watches. He now is a watch dealer. We compare watches to the art market and all things passion assets. Please subscribe, enjoy this episode, and be happy, never content. Right, welcome back to the podcast, Steve Sally Study. We're at our second home, Woodbury House Art Gallery in Mayfair, and I've got a friend, brilliant guest, former professional athlete, footballer, Man United, England, but now also a businessman, has been for some time actually, mm -hmm. in the watch sector, None other than Mr. Kieran Richardson. Thank you very much for your time, mate. I'm back, and I'm back in this <laughs> lovely premises. I love it. I haven't seen you in a few years. Where was it? In so I'm not so Shoreditch. So uh, we, we filmed in Shoreditch one time, didn't we? We filmed at the Curtain Hotel. Yes. Which is sadly now no, no longer. It's, it's changed hands. Okay. I'm still in communication with Michael. Yeah. Uh, Uchaban, who okay. is the owner, he's right. got um, the uh, uh, Gansevoort Hotel over in the Meatpacking District in New York. He's one of our collectors, actually, of Richard Hamilton, and we shot and filmed the documentary quite recently in New York, and he actually features in there. So I'm very, very excited to get that out. Um, I've been on the podcast with you twice, once on mine, and then another one with Rob Moore. Yes. Rob Moore was here yesterday. We were talking about watches. We were talking about art. We were talking about his boxing match coming up. Coming up. So you got a boxing match coming up. He's, he didn't tell he's, me that. He's, he's called out another property guy <laughs> and they've put 50 grand a, a, as a wager down. Charity. As, 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 as who, who's going who's gonna to knock each... <coughs> who is the person going to knock the other person really? out? 50 grand wager on it. Didn't know that. I didn't yeah, know that. I think it's J June or July the 1st in Brentwood. Amazing. So I'm going to go along to that. And also to add a bit of flavour to it, <clears throat> I forgot his name. It's Hank Lee, is it? So they both got property companies yes. and training companies. They're both the figureheads to their training companies, but then their 10 top staff sales members are also going to fight each other. Really? So they're at the undercut. I like it, I like it. So I'm looking forward to no, it. No, we've got a mutual friend, Rob Moore, great guy. Um, as you said, massive in the property game. Uh, watch Collector as well, as we know. Yeah, podcasts, or interest yeah. cars, you know, oh, really, really everything. good guy. So there's two elements, as I said off camera, I'm going to speak, speak to you about. One about watches, your take on watches, the investment side of it, the collectible side of it, the brands, your thoughts, your opinions, the bubbles, the crashes, mm -hmm. etc. Okay. Then obviously a little bit more about football, you know, where people are at right now, yep. uh, you know, in the football, football um, sector. But there's one other conversation that I didn't mention, which I'm just going to throw out right now, and it would probably take us only two or three minutes to cover. Yeah. Your fancy dress party that wasn't a fancy dress party that you made me go fancy dress at. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. You know what? I actually thought, I actually thought in my head, I wonder if he's going to bring it up, bring it up on, the, on the podcast. I don't... Miscommunication. Um, sorry about that. I thought I told everyone that fancy dress had been cancelled. And um, obviously the day my party come, everyone turned up in normal clothes and Steve turned up with his wife in fancy dress. But you still look, both of you look great. It was fancy, you was in fancy dress, but it wasn't like a fancy, fancy, like a whatever. You both, what was you come as? I come as a ringleader yeah. and she come as a ring girl. So I'm going to give a very, very quick sort of breakdown on it. And initially it was fancy dress. Yes. I, for some reason, wasn't added to the fancy dress party group. So I then went to New Cross where everybody gets their fancy dress outfit. That's where I mean, I'm from. Well. I'm from New Cross. Yeah. So, so a friend of mine gets all these fancy dress costumes from basically where they loan their costumes to films. We're talking about it look, 10 it look, out. It looked proper. Your thing looked proper. 10 out of 10 costumes, yeah. right? And they're not cheap. Yeah. We're not talking about 50 quid. We're talking about... 300, 400, 500 quid oh, sometimes, right. yeah? And you have to hire it for like four days because they normally give it to films. And I remember sending you a photo. I, think I, remember. Son, yeah, I remember. And I said, just making sure it's still on. Yeah. And the thing on my head meant that inadvertently, is it still fancy dress? Yes. And you said, yeah, it's no theme. And, yeah. I, and I thought, and I said to my missus, because she kept on asking me, yeah. is it honestly on? And mm. I went, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, look, yeah. it's no theme, it's on. I took it as I know. no Halloween theme or yeah. no... 
I know, film theme. Yeah, I but, meant I meant no theme no more. It's cancelled, but I'm so sorry about it. But uh, I feel like you both look great anyway. Yeah, no, no. No one cared. No, so <laughs> he, he, here's, how, here, he, here's, here's how we're going to sort of end this, this part of the conversation. When we were rolling up, I had a gut feeling for some reason that it wasn't, and she also did as well. And as I walked in, because she wouldn't walk in with me at the start, I walked in and I thought, fuck, this ain't fancy dress. But I always said to my business partner and everybody else, if it's not, here's the benefit. Everyone's going to know who I am. Yeah. And actually, off the back end of doing that, I've got a guest who was at your party who I've been trying to get on for a long time who remembered me, yeah. and he's now confirmed he's going to come on my See? podcast. So I've got Crazy, isn't it? some positivity off, off of a little, little bit yeah, of miscommunication. And he probably only remembered you because of your outfit. That's it. It's like that. Everything's meant to be, mate. Everything's meant to be. But it was, it was a good night. It was a good night. It was a very good night. Yeah. So how do you know? I'm 38 now. 38. 38. Hence the, the, the silver lining coming through the beard. Yeah, I'm getting a bit grey, but it's got, you know, it's got, I like it. It is yeah. what it is. I'm 39 in October. Life just goes so fast. Mm. So fast. Mm. But it's a blessing. Yeah. So, okay. So you retired as a footballer at 33 years of age, mm-hmm. which is... Pretty it's not, young. Not, it's not like super young. It's not obviously... Mm. But there are people now, you know, like Ronaldo mm. going towards their 40s and stuff. And... During from from that time to where you are right now, how fast has it felt? It's gone like that. It's gone so quick, like a blink of an eye. It feels like yesterday I retired, but with my retirement, I didn't really retire officially. I wasn't that type of guy who comes out and says on Sky Sports, "Oh, I've retired. I want everyone to see that I've retired." I don't care about all that. I just in the background, cracking all my company, not even thinking about it. Um, but as you said, footballers are retiring early these days, much younger, probably because they got much more, more money. They've got, you know, if you go back 30 years, guys probably go a bit, a bit longer because they're not making the money as what they are making now. Mm. So I think in the future, we might even find guys retiring all the time, normal, 30 years old. Yeah, yeah, you know? for sure. Because they're making so much money. Yeah. Um, going to talk more about, for now, like the watches and your brand, Broad, Broadwalk, and you've yeah. obviously got your podcast, uh, Broad Talks mm-hmm. podcast uh, with Henry, who's a phenomenal guy, you know, get along with him super, super, super well. Um because the first podcast I had with you was probably more about, you know, being an athlete, yeah. sports person, Manchester United, yeah. et cetera. And I do want to come back to that. The watch industry. Mm-hmm. So before I talk about that, you've come into Woodbury House and I do honestly feel that watch buyers are the same buyers typically as art buyers. And yes. the art buyers are typically the same people that probably buy nice properties. Yes. And they're the same people that buy nice cars. Correct. So the appetite, the, the, the culture, the individuals that are buying watches today from you and from the watch market, who are they? What type of people are they? Oh, all different businessmen, CEOs, guys who just want to invest money. Normal guys got... Honestly, the, the, the range is so big in the watch industry you'd be surprised you, everyone thinks oh it must be like a top one percent people buying all these watches but you, the way the market's gone so boom in the last four years especially you find a, just a normal guy I'm, I'm just normal people who make, make probably whatever they, they see the investment so big they just want to jump involved and get involved in it um but as you said luxury items everything's connected you know most of my clients have good, good cars and they like cars I'm guessing art as well. So everything luxury, you know, it's all connected really. Yeah. Um, I'm, I, look, with the art industry, even though I don't position myself as an art expert, mm-hmm. but to be quite frank, if you're in it since 2014 and every single day of the week, and I'm talking weekends as mm-hmm. well, and I'm talking birthdays, I'm talking Valentine's, I'm talking Christmas Day, you are talking about work, you're talking about the market yeah. and you're immersed and you become collectors as well. Correct you start to build up a bit of knowledge. Yes. Even if you don't try to, it's just natural. Yes. And I always say the same thing. If you're gonna, if you're gonna buy something that you like, that's one element. If you're gonna buy something you like, but also something that you believe mm-hmm. is a safe buy and yeah. something that could appreciate over time, buy people that are significant to their, to their genre mm-hmm. or to the, who are significant to the history of, of their movement, okay? Mm-hmm. Richard Hamilton, the Godfather Street Art, done that. Mm-hmm. Picasso done that for modern art. Andy yes. Warhol done that for pop mm-hmm. art. And then obviously you've got so, so many other greats. Um, with watches, would you say that's the same? I mean, if someone were to buy a watch, do you advise them to stick to the big brands or do you actually say, actually, look at this brand because they're making some noise? Like what you said there, like, I wouldn't say I'm an expert on watches, but because I'm around it so much since I'm, I've been into watches since I was... 
since I was 16 years old, I bought a Kanye tank when I was 16. I've always had that thing for watches. So even though I was a footballer, on the side, I was always buying watches, collecting. And then where I've been around it so much in the last 15 years, the expertise gets stronger, the knowledge. You know, when you buy a watch in, you do your research on that watch. So definitely, I feel like over the years, you, your power, your knowledge becomes so there because I'm around it every day. This, this is my job every single day. I'm into watches, I buy and sell watches. And I'm learning every day. And there's so much information to learn about, especially vintage watches. I don't really go to the vintage side because there's so much to learn, so many forgeries, so many con men on, on the vintage side. Think dials get swapped out, movements get swapped out. It's, it's, it's a complete ball ache. That's why I, I tend to stay away from the vintage. Everyone's got an opinion with it. Oh, that's not right. Oh, there's something wrong with that bracelet. So I don't really go that way. I always go to the more modernly watches. And going back to your question, I only probably buy and sell four brands. Patek Philippe, Audemars PK, Richard Mille, and Rolex. They're the only brands that I sell and that I know which I got my forte on them brands. Yes, there's so many amazing brands out there for more watch connoisseurs. But for me, I stick to what I, can, what I know, what people want, demand from my clientele. Don't get me wrong, whatever you, whatever I sell, you, you, be, you get that new clientele like FB Johns. If I sell FB Johns, I'd have FB Johns clients. But because I sell what I sell, I have them type of clients. Yeah, understood. But for, for me, them four brands is what I stick to and what over the years I found are solid investments. Yeah. Very, very solid investments. I get it all the time. I mean, we have Google campaigns, we have social media campaigns, we have word of mouth, we have people just rocking up to our Mayfair gallery. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the time, a collector, investor, someone's in the art market who's mm -hmm. quite passionate about all different types of genres will drop me a few questions about this artist, that artist, mm -hmm. or this genre, that genre. And my, my answer is always kind of the same. They're probably good. And if you like them, mm -hmm. probably buy them if you can afford yes. it. We are not a shop and we're definitely not jack of all trades as far as different genres are concerned but mm -hmm. if you want to go to a specialist who specialize in just two artists which we are mm -hmm. you've come to the right place because yeah. i can tell you everything you need to know about these artists mm -hmm. but other artists i might be only be able to give you 10 percent knowledge 20 yeah. percent knowledge yeah. and i feel that it's probably where you're coming from with yeah. like the whole knowledge about rolex patek philippe ap and um all the mars even them, um, even them four brands, there's so them. many watches, so many models. Listen, don't ever pretend to be something that you're not. I don't, I don't need to front to no one. I'm an expert at this. I know every history about a Patek, because I don't. It's, there's so many watches. Yes, I know all the, the, newest, the newest watches, probably in the last 20 years. Remember, I'm only 38. Well, I'm, these brands go back hundreds and hundreds of years. So me personally, I just stick to what I know. Um, also, you, like anything, when you're a trader, you, for me, you go with the trends. You know what's selling now. And you know what's, even though I I have specific watches that I believe in long term, like I like today I'm watching, I'm rocking a, a 5370P. This is not even on the catalogue, but I like it. It's a great watch. It's beautiful. It's a split second chronograph, you know? So a lot of people don't even know what that is, mm. but it's a beautiful piece, an enamel dial. I like it. I would say to my clients, buy watches that you like. You, you're the one who's got to look at every day. I know it. what we're finding now, a lot of people are seeing such rise in investment in watches, they're thinking about just money. Where when I got into the game, it was all about just, just the look of it. I just love looking at my watch, looking down and seeing it looks beautiful. I, mean, I know time to, every time tells time, my phone tells time, but I like a nice timepiece of my watch. Even though it's funny because when you walk into a room and the first thing people will say to me, oh, you've got a lovely watch. Subliminally, I just look at my watch, even though you don't might not know me or whatever. You, you look at my watch and you already judging me. It's weird. Like even me, I'm a watch guy. I will walk into anywhere in the world and I will see a guy on with whatever a nice watch. Or I know it's rare. Already, I think, wow, he knows his watches. I'm judging him, type of guy. It's weird. It's a very, very fickle, fickle world. Yeah, it's, it's mad. It's no different to someone that buys a piece of art. I was going to say cars, but probably only certain type of cars as well. Mm. But that, that kind of mindset and that kind of culture and that kind of language falls into the same bucket. Mm. The reality is if someone had a very rare 1980s Richard Hamilton Stanley shadow figure or shadow woman, which mm -hmm. I just showed you upstairs, yes. which are uber rare, mm -hmm. 
if you knew about that 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 history, yeah. that genre, and who these individuals were, mm -hmm. you see that on the wall and go, number one, that's expensive. Number two, interesting that you bought that, yeah. opposed to what he's probably a bit more known for. Yeah. You're probably quite sophisticated. Mm -hmm. You start to kind of, kind of think about the, t the yeah. person's education mm -hmm. and, and obviously their, their their appetite. Yeah, and it's when you got like, look. Normal Daytona. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have a Daytona. Yeah, they're yeah. cool, yeah. but they're but they're kind of. I don't want to say everyday watch because it's it's not an everyday mm -hmm. watch for some people, but mm -hmm. for for a lot of people in the watch industry, it can be perceived as everyday watch. Yes, and it and it's fine. But if you were to pull out some sort of rare Tiffany, mm -hmm. Patek Philippe, Nautilus, you'd yes. be like, wow, you you probably got money mm -hmm. you probably got really good taste yes. you're probably educated and yes. you probably know that that is super red hence why you went for it 100 percent. um i had a client of a day trying to sell me his tiffany protect and i said to him it's a very niche market to, to buy a tiffany doll you probably got to be into your watches and know about it because a normal guy won't care about a tiffany doll he'd rather buy the plain one which is 100k whereas the tiffany doll same watch but just a tiffany stamp on it will be 300k and he's, he doesn't care about the difference. So it's a very niche market, certain watches. Um, but as for me, I just love learning about watches. Mm. There's on the night, you can learn every day I'm learning mm. so many things. And what I find is the watches that I tend to buy or take into stock, I research about them and learn about them. Because remember, I'm trying to sell these watches to people. You have to know your product. Yeah. Otherwise, you just sound stupid. Um, so the question that I know you've been asked and the question you'll probably be asked forever being a watch dealer mm -hmm. and someone in, in that space mm -hmm. is AP, Patek Philippe, mm -hmm. Richard Mill, mm -hmm. Rolex, which one is the better brand? Well, number one, number one, obviously Rolex. We know that because it's the biggest brand in the world. Okay, but we know but like measuring it yes is that is that based upon revenue mm -hmm. or is that based upon reach their their brand reach globally yes that's, that's where i'm going obviously brand reach everything rolex is number one nothing can be undeniable but if we're talking about actual watchmaking remember rolex it's made the machines these these, these protects they're handmade beautiful things you know even some ap's protect for me number one is protect that's me, my personal opinion. Um, but if we're talking about just branding and the biggest, there's no undeniable Rolex is the biggest brand. Yes, if you buy a nice steel Rolex, your money's kind of safe. You buy them at list. Remember, you, you've got to be buying these watches at list if you can, but no one can. You can't get them. There's too many. There's no, you can't, I can't walk into an AD9 Rolex and say, I want a steel Daytona. You just say, all right, uh, wait 10 years. We'll mm -hmm. get, put you on the list. Mm. buy a few watches for your wife or in between and we'll get you one where I know people don't want to wait 10 years and we might not be here in 10 years time people just want it now they'd rather just come to me and pay double the price even though your money's still safe anyway I always say to people okay so I'm giving you an example of a steel Daytona 116500 LN a normal steel Daytona ceramic bezel is £12,500 that in Rolex but you're not getting it as I said but if you come to me, I'll sell it to you for the same watch, say 21 grand. So it's near enough double. But nine times out of 10, the value's still there anyway. When you come back to me and say, Kieran, I want to, I've used it now, I've enjoyed it, I've had a good time, I want to sell it. All right, I'll give you 23 grand for it. That's me being a trader. Because I, I, I know really, really it's probably worth 26 grand now. So it doesn't matter about where you get in. It's like anything, when you get in, get in. It can be anything, property, crypto, when you get in, if you believe in it and you buy a solid investment, you obviously you have to, I always say to people, do your research, study about these things, see where it's been, where it's gone, what's the lowest point it's been at. You, you, you'll be all right. But I, I always say stick to them brands and then you'll be, you'll be kind of safe. So, so if someone approached you and I'm guessing it's happened over, over time mm -hmm. where people are, yeah, I've got, a, I've got a passive knowledge about mm -hmm. all these big four brands and yeah. I like watches, but I wouldn't say I'm, the biggest fanatic in the world but i've heard via my friends mm -hmm. and via family members that watches are a really really good place to put your money yeah i've got a million quid today yeah where would you advise me to put that i would say if you got a million quid today in today's market right now even though it's come down remember go back eight months ago watches were booming crazy and they, they pulled back like we all know we're going through economy whatever we're recession whatever we're going through Watches a pullback. Me, I'd buy rare, 
doesn't matter which brand that I've, me me personally I'd buy a rare Patek, rare Rolex. I'll stick to them two at the moment in today's market. Yes, you can find a rare AP or RM, but I feel like of RM, even though RM is my favorite for me personally, it's like a favorite brand of mine. I'm like, you know, we're Lamborghini guys. We like Lambos, right? It's a, mm. it's a certain type of guy. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's Marmite. If you like it or you hate it, I've always been attracted to RM since 2010. I'm going to say I bought my first RM 002. I think we spoke about it last time. Mm. You had an RM on when you were. Doing I, had a, I had a 002 one, a yeah. white gold one at the time. Yeah. But that wasn't the first one I bought. The first one I bought was a rose gold one. And I paid 60 grand for it. And then watch it's a 250 now. But. You buy what you like. RMs, were, I've always been attracted to RM. Me per, me personally, I just like everything about it. The brand, everything, even the look, everything about it. But someone else hates it. Mm. So buy what you like, your own thing, what you enjoy. It's your money. And I always say to my clients, yes, you can make money. But you, like anything, you can lose money. I've lost some money in watches over the years. But you try and put your money into correct things where you, you know less percentage of losing money the rarity in thing going back to your question more I like to buy things rare hard to make they don't make many of them because if there's a watch in the world there's only 10 in the world who's to say I, I, can, I can dictate markets yeah so <clears throat> this is a bit of a fantasy question but mm -hmm. I just want to get your take on it so I went, if I go to the four brands and I'm not talking about concepts I'm just talking about if I had Ah, oh, I don't know. Should we call it a million quid again? Or yeah, no, maybe, maybe not even much of that. Five hundred or yeah. even a hundred grand. Okay, yes. so I've got I've got five hundred grand, right? Yes. And I can only put it on one watch. Yeah. So even if the watch cost me a hundred grand, I mm. don't. The, the rest of the money disappears. Mm -hmm. Five hundred grand. I, I've you've gone to protect Philippe. Mm. What are you buy him? I've and gone buy. directly into the brand. So yeah, you can have any watch you want, yes. and you can only buy one watch with up to five hundred yeah. grand. What do you buy and why? Oh. I might, well, sorry, sorry, with that question, are you saying that I'm going into Batek directly? I'm talking, or talking to me? Because there's a difference. No, so Kieran Richardson is yes. gone into a Patek Philippe or yeah. another Kieran Richardson yeah. who's got access to yes. anything. Yes. And you go, what, what are you after, mate? And you mm. go, right, I want to buy a Patek Philippe and yes. I've got up to yes. 500 grand. Mm -hmm. This is what I want to buy. Okay. I'd lo I would love to be that person. I would say, I would speak to Patek and say, I would like. They, want, they probably wouldn't do it at first, but they do make watches for people, one-of-ones. I know I'm going to be off subject here. I don't know you want to get put more. But yeah, they, maybe I, not concepts. I, yeah. yeah, but I'd say, ugh, oh, so many. Okay, so if I would say the green 5711, they stopped making it now. That was like the last of production for them. The green dial, 5711. We'll, plain face. Plain face. I would ask for that watch. It comes in a baguette bezel as well, which is unbelievable. But that watch there, I would probably ask for that watch only because a 5711 is iconic, great piece. Uh, it comes in blue dial and white dial, but it, and they, dis they discontinued it. But the last run of run, run of it, of the mill, was the green dial. Okay, and what is the retail price of that? Oh, must be like, it's funny, I don't even know these retail price because it's so light, I'm so, I never get it at retail. I reckon the retail on that price is probably around 30 grand. And the grey market and what that means to people listening, it means a, se a second hand or second market. Yeah, so the green, the whole 5711, uh, in height, go about eight months, they were probably 400 grand. Realistically today, what do you reckon you can get one for? A quarter of a mil. Okay. Same question about AP. Yeah. Up to 500 grand, walk in there, any what you want. Right now, currently AP, I'd walk in there and get a perpetual calendar, Ceramic skeleton. To be fair, the blue dog, the blue one just came out as well. Have you seen the blue one? Rob Moore's got an order. He's got an order. That's what he reckons. Yeah. Have I thrown him under the bus? Yeah. You throw him under the bus. <laughs> I'll say Rob. for me, I, I like that. It's a great watch. I think list around them will probably run about eighty thousand. They're we're talking hundreds. That's a great watch. Yeah. Perpetual calendar. Either you get a skeleton doll, and they don't have to be skeleton, but black ceramic. Great watch. Beautiful. Same question about Richard Mill. 500 grand, walk in there, can buy anything you want. <sighs> Can't get you nothing these days, mate. <laughs> <laughs> no, I reckon Richard Mill right now is going for a funny, I'm not really having, I love Richard Mill, but right now, if you look at their catalogue, there's nothing really jumping at, at me under 500. Because, you know, Richard Mill, we're going up to 
million pound watches, which is like the tall billions. So I'd probably say for anyone who wants to buy Richard Mill right now, looking at their current catalog, I'd probably ask for a 6501 uh, NTPT. Um, that's a nice watch, I think they're like 300K, but it, it's nothing really, nothing really, uh, right now RM, not really jumping out. I'd rather get, a buy an RM what's been discontinued, which is loads of them. I'd probably put my money into 1103 McLaren, which are currently around 400K. It's a great watch. I'm talking dollars as well, by the way. Sorry if I work in okay. dollars. Um, so about 300,000, about 330,000 pound, I would say RM11 McLaren, great watch. How do you actually pronounce the name? Richard Mill, Richard Mille, Richard Mill. There's, think, there's loads of different I think pronunciations. What, is, what does it matter? It comes down to you as a person. Who cares? Yeah. If you say Richard Mille, Richard Mill, RM, what does it matter? Uh, you, you know what I mean, so don't stress about. It. I know a lot of people are like, "Oh no, you got to say it like this." This is the great, the the perfect way to say it. Man, I don't even care, mate. I'll tell you a funny story before I go into the Rolex question. Yeah. It's um not Rolex question. The uh, uh what did we cover? Protect for late AP. Yeah. No, Ro was it Rolex? I think we covered them all, haven't we? No, we ain't no Rolex yet. We haven't no Rolex. Rolex, Rolex. Okay, but we're so anyway. I was walking down the street once when I didn't know the area. This yeah. is going back ages ago, and I went, "Oh, do you know where Her Hermes is?" To yeah. someone, yeah. and she went, "No." She went, if you're looking for her mare, oh. and I was like, you fucking bitch. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, like, just, you, you she know, knew what I meant though. I know, of course, of course she yeah, does. Yeah. I just don't like, I don't like that way, just because I can't pronounce something correctly, or someone who's from another country pronounce, pronounce it differently. We're all, you know what I mean. So what does it matter? Yeah, exactly. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> I remember her saying to me, she went, if you mean her mare, yeah. and I was like, oh yeah. Uh, that's that's yeah. a job's worth, mate. Yeah. 500 grand walking into Rolex today, you can have access to anything you want, but you can't take the change home, okay? I'd think for 500K, I think you, I think the list price on, I'd go for a Skydweller, full bling, meteorite dial, very rare watch. I think Drake wears one. I think you must have seen It's like a full bling Skydweller. There's probably only very, very low numbers been made. You'd, you'd, you're going to spend the whole 500K on that one watch, but it's very rare. That watch now is probably worth around... 900 800 grand but you you got to spend crazy money to get it cool um the most expensive watch you've mm. ever sold Oof. definitely an rm richard mill for sure i think it must have around about 2.3 million dollars wow. uh yeah who the hell bought that <laughs> asian client it was a, um it was an rm skull <laughs> Um, it was big money. It was big money. But there's, there's, there's buyers out there. You'd be so surprised. You know, like, who spent... When I first got into watches and I first bought a watch, I spent like £14,000 and bought a Rolex. And I was like, I couldn't fathom spending that type of money on a watch. Crazy money for me. It's a lot of money for me, young kid. And it's a lot of money now. So when people come to me and say, oh, I've got this to spend, I, I know... the perfect thing that everyone says to me I know it's not a lot to you Kieran I'm like mate listen I've been there where you've been we all start somewhere yeah I didn't I didn't become like buying million pound watches or 300 grand watches overnight you build up steadily so I bought a, I bought a watch of 14,000 the next one was 18,000 then it was 21 then I thought oh I made three grand on that watch oh you, you get more confidence I feel like you got to get involved in it, dabble in it and get confidence. It's all good me saying to people, you can make money, but you got, you got to get involved. And then you, you see, you got to see. It's like, oh, like you, it's all good me, you telling everyone, the Richard Hammond's worth whatever, it's going to go up to this. Until you actually make the commitment and see what happens, then that's how you get confidence, right? So if I buy a, a piece of art worth 50 grand and then I sell it for 70 grand, I've got confidence with it. So I'm going to go, you know what? I'm going to buy another one. And go from like that. You have to be, I always say to people, spend what you can afford. Don't overstretch. Just take your time with it. And just enjoy it. Collect. Enjoy the watches. Wear them. And a lot of people now don't even wear the watches. I know you, we're in London or anywhere in the world, unsafe. Because everyone can see, you know, we see it every day. People getting robbed or whatever. And a lot of people just buy their watches as strictly investment. Put them in a the vault. Just wait for them to go up and sell them. But me, I like to wear watches. It's a thing I've always wanted to do. So when I meet clients who actually wear them as well, it, I like it more. Like, ah, nice, you're wearing it. Not just sitting pretty brand new in a sticker in the box. I get that side as well, because it's investment, I get it. I get both sides. But me as my own person, 
I'm wearing them. Like, I'm wearing them now. I'm wearing them. It's the same thing with uh, with cars, right? Um, I like it. Like for for example, yourself. If mm-hmm. I can say this, Mercialago SV, mm-hmm. and you used to have a special Ali mm-hmm. uh, four, uh, four five eight Ferrari. Yeah. And I like the fact that people like you and I've got a few other friends of mine have got fairly rare, expensive cars, mm-hmm. and they they not only take them out but they drive them. Yeah. They drive them, yeah, and yeah. I'm like, that's exactly how yeah. you, you're meant to use them. Listen, life's too short, man. Like. Life's, life's about experiences for me. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It's, yeah. ugh, I'm not bothered about, I'm not really driven by money like that. I, I'm driven by experiences, going under life, taking my family to a great place, great holiday, having a great memory in our head. Like even, like you go back to cars, <coughs> driving a car hard. It's a thrill. The whole point about cars, so cool about a Lamborghini or, or SV, feeling that power, that roar, you get a feeling, right? That's why you do it. No point me getting, no point me buying that car, it's just, Driving, not feeling it. Yeah, exactly. There's no point. Yeah. No point buying it. Um, I had a conversation with Rob about this this yesterday, and mm-hmm. he said, "Raise it with Kieran. I want to see his reaction." Cool. I said, "Okay, fine." Chrono twenty four. Yeah. Um, what is Chrono twenty four? I know what it is, mm-hmm. but for the audience, what is it, and what's your take on it as a watch dealer? Chrono 24 is a platform where all around the world, everywhere in the world, you can act, obviously there's a platform where people, dealers like me or even privates can put watches on there and sell them to people all around the world. Um, where a lot of people get confused with Chrono 24, like as Rob said, where you're based in, we're based in England. So w- w- what I do automatically, if I'm looking for a watch, so if people listen to me now, if you're from England and you're looking for a watch and you're going on Chrono 24, type in Rolex or whatever, go to the filter and type in UK watches because a lot of people don't even understand this. If you buy a watch from America, remember there's, there's import tax, there's money there, so you've got to pay. So people think, oh, the watch is, it says 50K there. Why is it, why in England, why is it more money? Why is it 20K more in England? Because you've got to go and pay the duty. You've got to pay 20%, 24% to get it over here. People don't understand that. So I always get people constantly saying oh your watch is more expensive than the guy in hong kong one okay watch is here now physical do you want it yes or no two you have to pay the duty on the watches the 20 20 percent people don't understand that yes you can ping you can send the money to the guy over there you've never met before it's a risk that is itself but when you bring the watch back into the country you got to pay money you got to pay it and people don't understand that Yes, you, you might get away with it, but when you come to do your tax returns and you got HMRC knocking your door saying, what's this over there? You ping money to another country, you got you got to pay, pay the duty on it. People don't understand that. So a lot of people in Chrono always come to me and say, oh yeah, but is a watch cheaper over there in wherever? Mm. It's, no, you're wrong, mate. And am I right in saying, like just knowing a few friends in the watch industry, and I'm not saying they, they do this, but mm-hmm. friend, good friends of mine who are decent, honest watch dealers, mm-hmm. very much like yourself, mm-hmm. have said that people can use it as a bit of a, a playoff. So they might list a watch, maybe yes. not under their brand, but under another brand. Yes. I'll give you one perfect example. Yeah. Right? I know someone called me and as you well know, I've got a 5990 Patek Philippe. Yes, um, still. still, And I, I love the watch mm-hmm. and I've not bought it as an investment. I bought it because I really, really fucking yes. love that watch. It's one of them watches where it's stainless so you don't really notice it. Mm-hmm. But like what we were saying earlier, I feel like it gives me a little bit more sophistication. Mm-hmm. I feel like I can go in somewhere and go, mm. that guy knows his stuff. Beautiful you watch. Know, a little bit, yeah? Yeah. I bought it for 39 grand. Lovely. Four grand over the list. I'm happy about that. And, and, at one stage, yeah. I think even one one of your clients said yeah. they'll buy it for like 70, 75 grand a few years ago when yeah. they serviced it with you. At one stage, someone called me and said, have you seen how much your watch is going to buy? And I went, well, I've heard it's gone up a lot, but not really kind mm-hmm. of followed it. They sent me a chrono and it was like 300 grand on there. Yeah. And I was like, it's all well and good listing something for 300 yeah. grand, but try and get 300 grand. So do you think there is a little bit of that that goes on? Oh yeah, on? definitely. Of course, of course. It's like these traders will try anything their luck but what you find the problem you find if you said 300 grand one guy puts it the 300 grand what do you do when all the watch traders pull up a 300 grand they we believe that's the market now and the guy who wants to buy it he's gonna pay it right if he believes in it he thinks oh yeah the market's there it's 300 grand it's not, it's not like i don't want to say it's a fake uh, a false market but false economy type thing, yeah, yeah but it's like anything if if that's the if that's if they're selling at that, 
then that's the market. If I put a watch up for 300 grand, it sells on that, then it's sold, right? Some, someone paid that. Someone was willing to part with that. A bit like the um, uh, Tiffany Dial mm -hmm. Pate uh, Patek Nautilus of yeah. the plain face. What, it sold for like four and a half million? Yeah. In auction? Yeah. Where, where's that watch today? That watch is two, two million today. Do you know what I'm saying? But at the time, someone yeah. was willing to pay it. Of and course. But set the president. Yeah. But also, you got to remember, all these Tiffany's you see around the world, all the, the LeBrons and all that are wearing it. They paid, what, $50,000 for that watch. Where, wherever the list is, it's low. So, pff, it's massive, massive gains. But someone also said the other day, to get that watch, you have to spend like $2 million in there on jewelry anyway. So, they, they, they know what they're doing. And I was at a watch show as well. And I, there was a guy behind the counter who would just look like... Fairly successful watch mm -hmm. dealer. Wouldn't say celebrity status. Yeah. Wouldn't say, I'm just going by appearance, mm -hmm. right? And that's quite shallow of me, but yes. I'm just being, being honest. And I was looking at him and I looked down and there was a, the, the, the Tiffany mm -hmm. face. And I was mm -hmm. like, oh my God, that's amazing. Like and then, fake, was, then, fake. then suddenly someone tapped me on the shoulder and went, mm. it's fake. he's got the normal one yeah. and he's just changed the fucking yeah. dial. So what happens? Yeah. This, this, is, this is why I, I find myself a bit different to other traders. Because for me, buying a watch, it's all about trust. That guy can go and sell that to someone. And, it, and it, trust me, it happens. It happens where someone will go and sell a Tiffany doll for $2.5 million. I've seen it happen. I know. Another trader has bought it, finding out the doll has been changed. It's not even a real Tiffany. That's just crazy. So imagine you doing that online or something. I know... You're not really going to send someone two and a half mil you don't know or not there. But you have to make sure that your watch dealer or trader who you deal with, you have to trust them fully. And that's why I always find that we, we tend to get a lot of business because from my background and who I am, people don't feel like I'm going to rump them and t t run away with 100 grand. Because I don't need your 100 grand. Do you know what I'm saying? Where yeah. someone else you don't know, where it's a bit, you don't, you don't know. So I, that's why I always find I tend to, I get a lot of customers for that, just for the, the trust side. And which is great for me. Yeah. And I, I play on that, which is cool because I do get a lot of customers from that just yeah. by just by my history, who I am, which is fine. Yeah. Being a footballer then, mm -hmm. former footballer, um, and I know, you know, you're a very private guy and therefore you probably treat other people the, the same, which I think is the only way to be. Mm -hmm. But it's probably quite public knowledge, some of your clients. Is there anyone you can list, like famous people that we would know who buy these type of watches? Um... Obviously, I have a lot of clients, but it's it's a funny one. Like, I get asked this question so much, and I always give the same answer. I don't like to tend to tell big names because it's like anything. Why do I want to open a can of worms for people? These these are proper assets. I'm walking around with three hundred grand. I'm like, oh, sorry, this watch is not three hundred. Sorry, you're walking around with a hundred ninety grand on your wrist. I don't want to blow up your spot. I don't want to say, oh, Steve's got a fifty nine ninety was worth a hundred grand. He's one of my clients. Okay, so next time I see Steve, Steve, where's your, you know what I mean? I don't yeah. want to, so I'm very private like that. I don't want to do anything like that. Understood. I, I, I have massive clients. I, I'm Trust me, massive clients, but I don't like putting it out there. It's different if they want to put it out there and say, I bought a watch off Kieran. That's cool. That's your own demeanor. But I never, ever, re very rare, I don't, I don't. I will never say, um, example, or whatever, um, LeBron James bought a watch off me. I don't do that. And a lot of dealers do do that for clout chasing. That's, that's fine. But I, I, I'm more thinking of, I more think about the person and the situations rather than the pound note. I think about them. I'm not trying to grow, even though I'm, oh, I want to grow my brand, but I don't, I'm not trying to think, oh, let me pull out a picture of me and LeBron there now. I just want to watch just to get bigger. I'm thinking about you as a person first. Yeah. Safety. Yeah, I, I understood. Um, last sort of question on the, the watch side of stuff. Um, there was the height, when I say the height, the most recent height, mm -hmm. where, where watches perceived to go crazy. And I'll yes. tell you the other thing I noticed. People that I don't perceive as watch dealers suddenly became watch dealers. Correct. And it, they almost become experts overnight. Yes. And it was almost a bit easy because mm -hmm. they would, I'll be added to groups and I'll mm -hmm. say, look at this particular watch. It could be a Rolex, it could be this. We think we know it's going to be X mm -hmm. in four weeks' time. And true to the word it was almost like they were Mystic Meg. They mm -hmm. could predict the future mm -hmm. and lots of people were buying and mm -hmm. everyone was flourishing, everyone was doing really, really good. Yeah. And then it took a turn for maybe the worst or, or say, something called a market cor yeah. correction. Yes. Why do you think it was at a high and why do you think the watch market took a crash? I feel, going back to you saying about all, everyone 
all of a sudden he thinks they're an expert, everyone becomes a trader. I feel like when, you, when you're on a bull run, it's easy to say, it's still going up, it's still going up, because it is when, when you're on a bull run, anything. Um, but I've seen so many spikes, so many crashes. I'll give you a prime example. Uh, 5980 rose gold, full bracelet. Go back four years, just four years ago, um, that watch was probably around 90K before, a little, before the little bull run, 80K. I remember in that year, that watch sold for around 155. And at the time I was like, wow, that is so much money, 155,000 pound for that watch. And, I, and then all suddenly, boom, pull back, back under 100. I'm going back four years. From that time when it's pulled back, everyone was like, nah, it's, ne it's never going to get back to that 150 again, 55. Geez, you've seen the last year or so. That same watch, I've sold that watch for a quarter million. Gone way past the 150 mark, all the way up to 250. And now it's pulled back again. It's just normal things for me hearing this. So I don't, it's like anything, people get fearful. But knowing, you, oh God, it's lost that much money. I always look at these things as opportunity. I, I like it because <laughs> watches that were 500 grand a year ago are now 300 grand. It gives me a chance to get in get because in. I believe in a watch. I know, I believe if, if it's a certain watch, if it's, if it's reached an all time high, can it get back there again? I think so, yeah. Because history's told us it's got back there before. So it's like anything you got, you have, but I'm willing, I'm willing to, I, I invest what I know it can go tits up. I don't, I don't, I don't, I always tell people it can go tits up for you, but it can be very profitable as well. And I've seen it, I've made money from it, mm. you know? So mm. this whole market, what's going on at the moment, it's pulled back, it's normal. I've been there so many times. I've seen it so many times over the year. Um, why did it go up so fast? It's like anything, just why did crypto go up so fast? Why was BTC $69,000? Now it's $20,000. Just is what it is. And where you find is when, when everything's going up, everything's going up around it. And then when, when anything can be an economy crash or interest rates, pulls everyone back down. What's the first thing people sell? Things, luxury items. It's the first thing to go, right? Mm. Always sell luxury items. And that's when you, it's what it is. People just want to, people panic and sell in fear. So I always say, just, just try, listen, Invest what you what you can. Don't overstretch. Don't overstretch. Yeah. Invest what you can. Um, some people can get carried away. Like even this little, as you said, this little bull market. I'm sure. So I know. Not even end users. I know so many traders. So many traders who have lost a lot of money, where they got carried away themselves. Oh yeah, let me buy that watch for a million dollars. It's not like it's never going to end. It's never going to end. Where you, you you got caught in the hype. Got caught in the rodeo. It's pulled back. Now nah, these lot, of these, lot of these, lot of these guys, they want, they're not around. They've been wiped out. They're on, they're, they're on new professions. These, these so-called guys who turned up became a, a watch dealer. They, they've been wiped out overnight. Where they, they thought, yeah, keep pumping money in, and all of a sudden it just boom, fifty percent decrease. It's, it's, it's horrible. I hate talking about it because it's, not, it's not nice. I don't want people losing money. It's not nice, but we're, it's, it's life. It happens mm. all the time. We get crashes all the time in everything. Mm. Stocks, whatever, everything is a crash. Mm. And mm. It's where I like to feel, I'm in a position where, where I'm very fortunate. I look at it as an opportunity to get involved again at a lower rate where a ceramic steel Daytona was 35 grand. Now they're 20 grand. I, would, I was about to buy one at 35 grand, but now I've got opportunity to buy at 20. But the problem is people... When it's at 20, they don't want it. They want it when it's 35. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like anything. <laughs> you, you, never want it, you, you never want it when it's low. You always want it when it's high. It's so weird the mind that people think. It's crazy. <laughs> it's mad. Well, I'm the, I'm, I'm the opposite. I'm in when it's low. I mm. believe in it to go back there. Mm. Yeah, it's a good philosophy to have. So run, running this off, right? I know you're not Mr. Meg, mm -hmm. but you're in the game yeah. and you, you, you have an opinion. Mm -hmm. So if I'm an investor, mm -hmm. I know first and foremost, by saying you like, right, we tick that box and do your own research, I'll tick that box. Yes. But then I'm coming to you and saying, right, I'm gonna do something anyway, off yeah. my own back, but mm -hmm. I just want the last bit of opinion from you. Yeah. Where do you see the luxury watch market going mm -hmm. in the next 12, 24 months? I think, can it go any lower than where it is now? I, think, I, like to say, I like to think the bottom is out. 
where, where we're at now, the bottom is. But pff, you just never know what's going on in the world. I just can't. But me, I feel like we're so down now from where we was. Oh, but there's so many great deals out there. So many great deals. Like you've got a Platinum Daytona. Platinum Daytona, what a great watch. Great watch. Just a normal dial. In Rolex, they're like 63 grand. They might have gone up now to 65. You can catch them around even grey market, off market. You can catch that watch in 70 grand, 80 grand. You're not far off retail. So you, you if Rolex rang you now and said, Steve, you got, I've got your Platinum Daytona at list. Nine times out of 10, if you've got the money, you you take it, right? Mm. So you, we're not far off there now. So there's great deals for people now. And you've got to shop around, try and find the best deal for yourself. But yeah, uh, it's, there's so many deals out there, man. I'm just, me, I'm clear, I'm buying them up. Mm. I'm, sho- I'm shopping. I'm shopping. A Richard Hamilton collector, in actual fact, he collects Black the Rat as well, a client of mine. Yeah. Really nice guy. He's been to a bunch of our shows. Called me yesterday and he was just, because he knows I'm into the watches and we like talk about Patek mm-hmm. Flip and he got a call from Patek. And as you well know, they don't categorically say, you're guaranteed to get this watch next week. But they said, look, yes. read between the lines, this time next year, so 2024, you're mm-hmm. going to be offered a 5990 yeah, Rose. Rose. Yeah, beautiful watch. Patek Philippe. And I went, how much is the retail? And they mm-hmm. said like 96 yeah, grand. Yeah, 96. It was 92. I think it's gone up to 96. 96 grand. They just put their prices up. And... That was, I mean, look, in height, they they were commanding 350, yeah. apparently. Yes, they was. What, and they, they were they selling now? They were selling like that. Yeah. They were selling like that. What are they now? 200, 250? No, no. Now they're around 240, 230. Trade, trade probably 220, maybe pick up 210. So well over double his money. Oh, yeah, no, he's double. Whenever you, whenever you get like a hot watch, all these people out there who are trying to get on the list, nine times out of 10, the hottest watches that you want, Daytona, Sky Dweller, when you walk out the shop, it's double. 15 and 90 rose gold is double straight away. Yes, some watches ain't double, but when you're buying a hot watch, which is in demand, there's a way you, you, you're going to make money. Maybe not be double. Maybe you made 20,000 or 30,000 or even 3,000, but you've made money. Yeah. So it's worth to buy it, right? Yeah. And also remember when, you're, when these people are buying watches from the ADs, you're building your relationship with these ADs. So next time you've bought one watch, you're going to get another watch. You want to keep building your relationship with them and getting more and more out of these official dealers. Mm. Well, I'm actually going to ask you one more thing Mm because it just hit hit my mind about watches. Why, this is not my words. Yes, go on. And I might even touch on this in the first podcast. Mm. Why do a lot of watch dealers and when, I'm probably going to, I'm not going to say the person's name, but who are quite outspoken and quite Irish and got brown hair, (laughs) um, say that Hublot are rubbish. (laughs) Oh, um, yeah, I know you're talking about. Um, <laughs> why they say it's rubbish? Because proven stats show us that it has been rubbish. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like, but it's weird. Because it's like it's like fashion, right? Things go out of fashion, but also the way it's made. Hoblo, I've, ne- I've never been a fan of Hoblo, but I've been in the time where a big band was popular. A rose gold big band, any big band was popular watch. I've got one. Yeah. There you go. People were paying 20, 10 grand for it or whatever. It was popular at that time. So it's a hard one. Jacob and Co, a prime example. Jacob and Co, I bought a Jacob and Co for, I don't know what it was, the color one. Remember the colors one? Beckham was wearing David it. Beckham. Jay-Z was there wearing it. you go. It. Sometimes you can get caught in a hype and follow what Beckham's wearing or Jay-Z's wearing and it just goes bang. And then when they, they get bored of it and it's not really... It hasn't, doesn't have the pedigree, the background pedigree. That's why I said to you, stick to the, the brands that have the background pedigree. Patek, AP, yeah. Rolex. Even RM hasn't got the background pedigree because it's been going since 2000. But it's very well made. AP were making RM um, movements for the last, God knows how long. They've, they've only just parted ways. Yeah. No one knows that. AP were making their movements. But they're so, like, I, I, because you'll know better than I do, I wrap my brain about Hublot because I don't think they're bad looking watches. Mm-hmm. I think some of them are quite nice. Yeah. My favorite boxer of all time is Floyd Mayweather. Yeah. And it was a massive, massive, I mean, look at the Conor McGregor fight. He had Hublot yeah. across the front and then he was gifted mm-hmm. by, uh, mm-hmm. by Hublot. Yes. Basically a belt version of mm-hmm. this. I saw it. And, and I thought, I thought it looked really, actually yeah. quite cool. Yeah. And when it was on his wrist, I thought that looks quite nice. Mm-hmm. Then you've got like Jose Mourinho, so mm. Alex Ferguson. You've yes. got all these great super individuals who are rocking them, and yes. you've got it. 
half time Hublo you've mm. got the F1 Hublo mm-hmm. it's everywhere yeah. but it's still not enough to get people to go yeah it's a cool box though mm. remember one they're getting paid to wear that they're free for them guys it's free right so you don't if you're getting paid to wear a watch you're wearing it right if I if Broad, Broad will go watch out and I'm paying you 10 million pound a year to wear my watch you're going to wear it and <laughs> you know what I'm saying that's what, that's what happens is they're marketing but I just feel like with Hoblo I don't know it's something about the design I, I, I never, I've never ever bought a Hoblo but I know it was popular but I like to buy watches that are classic even though RM's not really classic but I, I, I just drew to it originally um, Hublot's for me I don't even touch it I, I don't think I've ever bought one I don't think sorry I've, I've sold one once uh, and you, even when I sold a Hublot to this guy, I said, you might lose money. And right now, you probably will lose, lose money oh. on that brand. And how did he react to that? He didn't care. Th- that doesn't matter because he liked it. That's what I'm saying. It's nice to meet people like that. You like the watch. I said to you, you might lose 20% in that watch. He didn't care. I like it. I don't care, which is great. Yeah, I, lo- I love people like that. Yeah, definitely. I love it. Bit about football then to conclude the podcast, okay? Do you miss being a professional Premier League footballer? Uh, no, I miss, I miss my teammates. I miss the banter. I don't miss me having to lace my boots up and go out at three o'clock. It's weird. It's weird me saying that. I miss my friends. I miss the changing room. I miss the banter. I miss tr- like the banter change room. I miss the boys. I miss that. I don't actually miss the football itself. But it's funny because I watch football so much now. So much. I love it. But when I was playing, even though I would watch football, you don't, I never used to watch it as much. Now I'm like, yeah, Arsenal, Man City tonight. I'm watching that. I'm like, I have to be home for 7.30 or whatever the time is. But when I was a footballer, I didn't really care about watching football like that. Yeah, if a big game was on, I'd definitely watch it. But now as a person who's not playing no more, I actually enjoy being that fan. I'm an Arsenal fan. I love it. I'm buying season tickets next season. I'm enjoying it. But me per se, I think because I played football from such a young age, from a little kid, eight years old, all the way to 33, it became, in the end of my career, it became like just a job for me. It wasn't, I, 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 didn't, I kind of fell out of love with it. I lost a spark. You know, when you, when you first you just love football all the way up to, I reckon probably 29, 30, where it started going a bit, mm, I enjoy it still. I still enjoy it, but the love, just lost that little bit of love. You're going through the motions, yeah. Going through the motions, picking up paychecks, and it, it can it can show on your on your performance. It, it does show on performances, and you see it. We see it every day with footballers, and it's it's hard. It's not easy because you make so much money. These guys, are, it's hard. This is why I always take my hats off to Messi, Ronaldo, the richest footballers in the world, but they're still the best. They could just how many footballers we see get a massive contract. Oh, I'm an Arsenal fan. We've we've given that big contracts, and they're, they're gone. Straight off that big contract, it's, I don't blame him because it's so much money. It's hard. That's why I salute Ronaldo and Messi, maintained to be the best. That hunger, that obviously their drive, not money. We can see that. But how many footballers do we see just give up? They've got the big paycheck now. They kind of like put the, took the pedal off. Do you know what I'm saying? It's, mm. it's hard. It's hard. Yes, I can see the negative to it. And I, can see, I can see why they do it as well. Not intentionally, but subconsciously you think, oh my God, I'm getting a million pound every month. No matter what, even if I'm not playing, it's there every month. It's hard. It's not easy for people to maintain. You lose that bit of hungerness. You know, if you're making, if you're earning 30,000 grand a week and all of a sudden you go to 200, it's, it's mate, it's a big jump. And this happens to the guys all the time. Life changing. I Life inter- changing. I, li- I interviewed uh, about a year ago, probably eight, nine months ago, yeah. Matt, Le- Matt Letizia. I went yeah. to his, his house. Yeah. And that was the thing he said. I mean, he was, what, 10, 15, 20 grand, probably 10 grand a week, yeah. 15 grand a that, week. That, that, that was, that, 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 and that's a lot of dough. That's, Today's then, a lot of dough. Yes. Today's you know. a lot of dough. At a time, <clears throat> it, it, mate, you can only be at your era what it is yeah. if, if the market back then was 10 to 20 grand that's the market back then yeah. if my market when I was playing was 100 to 150 grand when I was playing that's then now we're talking 500 is that what you was on? <laughs> no, no I'm, not <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying it, it, you, you, it, it, it's just your era and money's getting stronger and stronger it is what it is yeah. that's why I never when someone gets a massive contract get what you can get mate because yeah. they can drop you just like that you can fall out of favour just like you that you can get injured you can get injured 
these clubs they don't look at you like that some they don't care yeah. if, you're not, if you're not performing you're gone yeah. so get your contract you can get well, that, what I was saying he was saying that that is the biggest challenge for young perceived football mm. stars because he'll, he'll see him go for the academies he'll see him go for the ranks and everyone's saying this guy's special mm. and he probably is mm. and the moment they secure this endorsement this brand mm. this, this paycheck or this club they a lot of them fall by the wayside yeah. and you said about the richest footballers in the world, so we've got a passion for it. I see Ronaldo and Messi, mm. and as you well know, my first love of sport isn't football, it's more boxing. Yes. Floyd Mayweather is the Ronaldo Messi of boxing. what he does. Yes. Because even still today, he's retired. He's 44, 45, 46, mm -hmm. and he's still going out there. He's fighting my mate Aaron Chalmers in a week's time at the O2 and exhibition yeah. and getting paid millions and millions of millions. He doesn't need to do it, but yeah. he's still performing. He's still raking it in because he's very good at what he, do, he does, and he's, he's still driven. My question to you, mm -hmm. <clears throat> we just had a World Cup. Argentina won the World Cup. Messi got to hold the World Cup. Yes. So my question to you, which I ask all footballers, mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. who is the GOAT, Messi or Ronaldo? They're both the GOATs, but if I had to pick one, then I had to pick Messi. Even though I'm, 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 I know I've played, I've played Ronaldo. I love Ronaldo. They're both amazing. They're both goats. When they pass away, they'll still be talked about forever. But just because Messi got that World Cup, it's a massive thing having having that World Cup. Because even before Messi had the World Cup, everyone was saying, "Yeah, but he hasn't won it yet. He can't be the the best of all time." Because Maradona won it, Pele won it. But now there's no question. He's won the pinnacle that any footballer would want to win. Even though they get their their, their own accolades World Player of the Year so many times but as a footballer to when, you, when you're thinking of the kids you want to walk up walk mm. up that's all you want to win right mm. it's hard because it's but, but going back to Ronaldo he's still in the good Portugal side so he could lead his side to win the World Cup it's not like he's playing for Denmark or whoever where we'd say oh yeah but if he was in a good side he would have won it he's been in a good side as well Ronaldo so I, I don't want to Argentina and Portugal seems kind of similar in, in that sense, team-wise. So I feel like Messi just took it to another level. But I think a lot of people forget as well, Ronaldo's 38 years old. He's playing the World Cup when he's 37. It's like near the end of his career. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's amazing that they're still going. It's, it's, it's unbelievable to be witnessing, witnessing them two in my lifetime. But if I had to pick one, if it was like there, only because of the World Cup. But also it comes down to what's, what style you like. Styles, right? You, they, they, they're completely different players. Ronaldo, you know, he can do most things, but I feel like with Messi, it feels more natural. God, talent is just beautiful to watch. But Ronaldo is more like trained on it every day, banging free kicks, banging this, banging that. Do you know what I mean? Working harder, right? where Messi was like, feels more God given. Mm. Do you know what I'm saying mm. there? It's a, it comes down to what you like at watching. Do you watch? Do you like watching Messi? keeping the ball tight, going past, jinking, scoring goals, side foot, bending it in, slowly caressing it. Or do you like Ronaldo just pff, kicking it, bang, straight. Do you know what I mean? Just powerhouse. It comes down to you, what you prefer. And I prefer probably Messi, but even though I love Ronaldo as well. Yeah. I know you know Ronaldo, played mm -hmm. with him. Mm -hmm. He was obviously at Man United, obviously in, in that same era. Yeah. If anyone can do it, he could probably pull it off. But the reality is being 38, is he ever going to play in another World Cup and win a World Cup? No. I don't think so. I think it's very slim no. to zero chance. And then also this phase two of Man United that didn't go so well. Mm -hmm. So my question to you, and I'm asking you to kind of guess, mm -hmm. but putting yourself, your perception, putting yourself in his shoes, he's yeah. just seen Messi win the World Cup. There's always been this ongoing debate about who is the GOAT. Now, both of them being probably quite egotistical yes. at times and being alpha males and driven and want to be the best, obviously. Mm -hmm. How do you think he feels now knowing that he can never win a World Cup? It's pretty hard to take. I would take it hard because you, you've always been same level and there's always, there's always been a debate. But now everyone's like, they here got the World Cup thing. Everyone's messy. Everyone's messy now. It's probably hard to take. I would be, I would be, I, I wouldn't take it easy because you know what you've achieved in your, in your career. Listen, he scored six, he, I was reading a stat. He scored 30 hat-tricks before he was 30 and he scored 30 hat-tricks after 30. That is just the mind-blowing. The numbers that he has done, Ronaldo, is mind-blowing. 
So he has to go. He is one of the greatest footballers of all time. We know that. There's no de- denying that. But he, listen, he can definitely be proud, man. What, what does it matter? <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? It comes down to what does it really matter? Okay, so you think Messi, I think Ronaldo. It's amazing that he's even in the conversation, right? Mm. It's amazing. Mm. But his goals, his stats will be there forever. Undeniable. Definitely one of the, one of the best players ever to grace football. And it's amazing. I know the answer to this next question, we're going to ask, ask it. And I think some people might be quite, quite surprised, but then there's a lot of logic behind it. Mm-hmm. You've played with Ronaldo, but who would you say is the best player that you've ever played with? Yeah, it's where <laughs> it's Paul Scholes, you know that already. I've said it a few times. Paul Scholes is definitely the most talented footballer that I've been around. Just quick upstairs. Um, doesn't need to run with the ball. It's crazy, right? Let, let's, let the ball do the work. One touch, two touch. Um, just play around you similar to like Iniesta and Xavi that type of player just unbelievable can do everything ping a ball 50 yards strike a ball tackle he can't he can tackle but everyone says he can't tackle just an all round player like for me that was the, my, my most probably the best player I've played with even though Ronaldo Rooney's Roy Keynes they're all unbelievable elite top but just that one little bit where in training where everyone's thinking the same thing, Paul Scholes. You were signed by Sir Alex Ferguson mm-hmm. and also signed by a former teammate, Roy Keane, yes. back in the day, right? Mm-hmm. Who's a better manager, Sir Alex Ferguson <laughs> or Roy Keane? <laughs> that's, that's funny. Um, Sir Alex Ferguson, number one. Best manager of all time. That's, there's no denying that. And that's that's Roy would wouldn't care anyway, but I enjoyed working for Roy. Roy was a good manager. I really enjoyed working for Roy. I feel like he got the best out of me, and I feel like even though he's a massive, he's, he's my favorite pundit right now as well. I love watching him pundit wise. Oh, he's so black and white. Oh yeah, that's that's just the way no, he is. Filter. But that's the way he was as a manager. I was going to. My second question is: I know Alex Ferguson has a tendency at the right time, yes, to blow up on certain people yes. to get the best but out. He of He knows them when and put them in check. Yes, Roy Keane is also a very fiery person, and mm-hmm. we saw the Patrick Vieira days. Or no, I can think it was Ian Wright. You know where he used to have like Vieira, a, Vieira, yeah, Vieira. Vieira. Yeah. Um, who could get angry the most, angriest, the quickest? Who was the most fiery, Alex Ferguson or Roy Keane? Both fiery. I, I'm going to say Roy was probably most fiery. You know, he's, he's, he, he was a captain, right? Always led by example. Always did things that he... It, 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 it's funny with Roy as well. He would never ask you to do something that he couldn't do himself. Unbelievable player. Never gave the ball away. Engine. God, I feel like Roy was a, the best captain probably of Man United's history for me. <coughs> I know people say Captain Marvel, Rob, um, Robbo, but... Roy King, the most greatest captain. He being a captain's about getting the best out of your team, leading. He was the perfect person for that, mm. and he could. Everyone respected him because of obviously what he did, what he did on the pitch. He lifted players up, and the players that who couldn't handle his, who couldn't handle him as a person, you just get left on the wayside. It's not for you. That club's not for you. Man United's not for you mm. because he's proven what he's done. He brings everyone up. He gets the best out of you. Yes, he can be harsh. You've seen him. Everyone sees him on TV every week the way he talks. There's no different the way he was in the change room. It's exactly the same. Black and white. Kieran, if you can't make that pass, get out of the changing room. Find someone else to come in and do it. Simple. I love that. Um, since you retired, the game has changed slightly. And the most obvious thing that's changed mm-hmm. is VAR. Yeah. Do you like... VAR in the current modern football game. It annoys me. Some, you know what? I do like it, but I, and like, sometimes I'd hate it. It annoys me sometimes. I don't like when like it's like a whisker, just a whisker, and they say, "Oh no, no goal." I was like, "Oh, it's kind of killed it, really." Would it get on my nerves if I was still playing? Um, I think I, I think I think it's okay. I think it's all right. In the end of the day, it's, 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 it is what it is. It's, it's the truth, right? Sometimes I got it wrong. You got it wrong for Arsenal the other day. You got it wrong, but yeah, I feel, I feel like it has sucked a bit a lot. Like it's, it's, that's the whole point about football, right? You go home and say, nah, that was offside. No, nah, that was definitely onside. It's like a, you know what I mean? It's a bit of banter at home or wherever. It's good to talk about things. Now nah, that's completely been wiped out. Do you know what I'm saying? But mm. I guess it's more, you could say it's fair now. Everything's just there, isn't it? It's black and white. Yeah. One last question about football and then we'll wrap up the podcast. So, you know, you said earlier you, you're, um, 
You're an Arsenal fan, right? Yes. That's not something that's happened last year. That's happened since you was a kid, right? Yeah. I always think this, and it, I think I might have even mentioned before to you, but you played for the best club in its generation, Man yes. United. Yes. You won everything, mm-hmm. you know, Premiership, mm-hmm. yep. Champions League, and then you obviously had your call up for, for, for England mm-hmm. representing your country. Mm-hmm. I mean, everything's going great. Mm-hmm. But don't you see it as a conflict of interest? You're an Arsenal fan, but mm. playing for Man United, is that a conflict of interest? No, I don't think so. Um, never. I, I, I would never... It's funny, I'm an Arsenal fan, but when you're actually playing for Man... When you're actually playing for your clubs, you're not really thinking about your f- Arsenal. I don't... I, I was, I, I'm sure most footballers as well, when you're playing for your club, whatever club you're at, that's your team. That's who you're riding for. That's who you're supporting. I don't. I, I wouldn't go on the bus after a game. And go. Did Arsenal win? Nah. It is what it is. And when I when I when I used to play against Arsenal, I've, I've knocked Arsenal at the FA Cup. I've scored a goal. I'm winning goal. I've knocked them out. I wanna. I don't feel like oh it's Arsenal. I don't. I just wanna win games. I just wanna win. Whoever I'm playing for, I just wanna win the game. I don't think like that. So there's no conflict whatsoever. You can support another club and still play for another club for sure. Yeah. So I know at two o'clock you're recording your podcast at Broad Talks Podcast. What is that podcast all about? Yeah, so that my podcast, we started a year ago now. It's basically about just watches. We talk about football. We have guests come on. Um, this season, I want, I want to talk about more about watches, more in-depth reviews, things we enjoy, investments. It's a, it's, a, it's a good podcast. I enjoy it. It was something that I was in my mind for ages. When I spoke to you about it, I want to just get involved in a podcast. I've kind of ticked the box now. I've done it. But I want to carry on, be consistent with it because you know how hard it is doing these things where I'm so busy with work as well, trying to sell watches and buy watches and tra- I'm traveling so much. It's hard to juggle sometimes being consistent, getting videos out there. So definitely 2023, I want to be more consistent with it. Definitely. But definitely come watch the podcast. We've had some good sh- good guests on there in the past. Ian and- Wright, Rob Moore. Yeah. You know, a bunch of people. Bunch of people. Rio. Yeah, Rio's been there. We've got a lot of guests who want to come on as well. We just... It's hard, you know, just finding people, slipping them in. These guys who I know, they're so busy, so busy. Like Mika Richards, I want, he's coming on the show, but it's just when, when's he coming on? Because he's, he's around the world. He's doing this, he's doing that. He's, and remember, when these guys are coming on, I'm not paying them, they're my mates. Do you know what I'm saying? It's different if I'm, going, if I'm ringing up Meeks and saying, Meeks, I'm giving you 50 grand. He's there tomorrow. Do you know what I'm saying? You've got Sky Sports, they're paying him. I'm not paying people. I'm not here to, I'm not, you're not paying me, you're my friend. You know what I'm saying? So it's hard when you're asking your friends to come on or whatever, or people who are not your friends, but they know you. Because I'm not paying you, really. Because I, I just want you to come on the show, tell us whatever you want to tell us. Um, so it's hard. I, I, I did actually look about, I know that if I want to get anyone, if, I, if I'm paying you money, they're coming on, right? Yeah. But do I, do I want to go that route? It's a lot of money. Can I, do I want to spend that money on giving chunks 50 grand to come on my show? It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a debatable one because if he does come on my show, yeah, it can go up higher, correct? It can do, but it, it might not. Viral, but it yeah. might not. It can go viral, but it might not. But I'm still out of money, but I don't, I, don't, I don't mind investing in things if I believe I can get a better, my podcast better. But right now, I like to build organically, start slow. I know these, I know these guys who are massive YouTubers. It takes time. Nothing ever happens like that. These guys, these KSIs, it's funny, I was chatting to my wife the other day about KSI. I met KSI probably, I'm going back for 18 years ago. I was in a, I was in a Sainsbury's car, car park. He come up to me, and he was like, can I have a picture of you? And I was like, yeah, cool. I didn't even know who it was. I had a picture of KSI. And then only when one of my, um, someone I know was like, that's K, he was young at the time. That's KSI. I was like, I don't know that. Who's KSI? Oh, he's a YouTuber who films himself playing games. But look where he is now. I'm going back 15 years. He's took all that time to build where he is today. People think things happen just like that overnight. Well, being an Arsenal fan, they've now, uh, they're the brand. Prime. And prime. Yeah. And, you know, they're the Prime is obviously a drink that him and Paul Logan yes. put together. They they're now sponsor Arsenal and now UFC. Really? And the mad thing is, and I've kind of sort of, I'm not saying worked out their business plan, but YouTubers have gone into combat. Yeah. Both done boxing, but it looks like KSI sticking to the boxing, got that demographic. Mm-hmm. Logan Paul is now going to WWE. Is he? He's been fighting. Really? And and they've got this... They're 
they're killing the they're game. Everywhere. They're killing the game. Luke they're, they're absolutely having it. But they're working hard. They're working very hard and smart. Hard and smart. They're working hard. They've put the work in over the years. They let the, the dog work's been done. Now they're reaping rewards yeah. and they're carrying on. Fair play. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, what, I'm on a thousand, two thousand subscribers on my YouTube channel. They were there as well. Yeah. Everyone was there. You was there. Everyone yeah. was there. Yeah, yeah. In two, in five years' time, I might be in three hundred thousand. It is what it is. It's the game. You got to be consistent with it. And these guys have been consistent, putting the work in, and they deserve it. Absolutely. So your uh, website, broadwalkgroup.com, yep. and the two guys to speak to is Kieran or Henry. Kieran and Henry. A lot of people ask me as well, why Broadwalk? Because that's the name of my road as a kid. Name is my road as a kid, Broadwalk in South London. And that's, that's your uh, Instagram handle. That's too, my right? Instagram handle as well. That's my website, www.broadwalkgroup.com. Uh, yeah, Instagram, Broadwalk. Last question. Be happy, never content. I asked you this question when you first come on. Every single guest, I asked them. Mm -hmm. That is my mantra. That's my quote. What does be happy, never content mean to Kim Richardson? I feel like be happy, never content is, for me, money's, not, money's never been my motive. Money's never been my, been my motive. My family are my motive. And my family bring my happiness for me. Um, but on the flip side, I like doing deals, I like doing things. And when you do things like that, money comes, right? So I don't, I don't like sitting still neither. I don't like being in one position. I like to always push forward. So even though I'm content family wise, but I always want to be better and get new things and achieve new goals. So I like every year I'll write down new goals for me, for my family, whatever. So I'm never content in that side. I always want to try and do better myself, either reading books or whatever, because you, you, you learn every day. Mm. So no, what's the point of being content and just sitting there at home, not doing nothing? I want to learn. I appreciate your time, bro. I love what, everything you're doing. And I'm very, very humbled that you said yes for a part two. And yeah, who knows sure. in the future, part three. Yeah, definitely. Nice one, brother. Wicked. Thank you very much. No problem. Cool.